Hello everyone, my name is Aaron Spooner and I am one of the cardiac surgeons over in Winnipeg. So today I am going to be talking to you about the trials that will likely come up on your exam and how it pertains to the guidelines. So I don't know about you, but when I was studying for my exam this was one of the most intimidating topics for me, a lot of it because it's so unknown and so in-depth in various areas. So today I have about half an hour to talk to you. I won't be able to get through all of the trials in all the detail, but I'll give you a basic understanding of the kind of things that should be expected of you for this exam and the type of knowledge and detail you'll have to go into. So again, we're here to understand the scope of knowledge expected for you and some questions pertaining to the important trials. We're going to review the important trials. Rather, we're going to review the relationship between the trials and guidelines and we're hopefully going to lessen some of the uncertainty and fear associated with this topic. So I'm sure as you know by now, there's no master list out there of all the papers you have to know for this exam. Potentially there could be dozens of them, uh, and many of them you're going to have to know in a substantial amount of detail. But we can focus on high-yield papers uh, and understand where the trials are going to come from that you have to learn. So. Trials can come from cardiac surgery and cardiology, and basically all big journals are fair game, particularly if they're within the past 10 years or so. so. What you want to do with someone studying these topics is to focus on papers addressing contemporary issues in cardiac surgery, especially when the, these papers compare two different treatment modalities. These are very popular ones in the exam, so give the pros and cons of PCI versus cabbage, SAVR versus TAVI, repair versus replacement, clip versus MVR almost certainly you're going to have this come up on the exam and there's going to be a table and you're going to have to write um, pros and cons for each or uh, numbers for each arm. Another thing that is very important is not just to look at the abstract of the, each paper. Um, some technical issues that will arise inside the paper you will actually have to know. And these examples that I give here aren't just things I'm pulling out of the air, but they have shown up on the exams in the past five years. So a big disclaimer for this topic is that there is no master list of what trials you need to know, and everything you're being told here today, as well as from your seniors or people that have done the exam before you, is just best guess guesses based on our experience. Uh, and the other disclaimer is this is a very text-heavy presentation. There are a number of trials in cardiac surgery that compare cabbage to PCI. Uh, the original syntax back in 2009, the updates to it, syntax 2, freedom, Excel, noble, these are all important things that you'll have to know. You'll have to know the numbers between each arms, um, the primary outcomes and secondary outcomes if there are differences between the groups. So first let's go over the syntax. The one-year results came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009. The five-year results came out in Lancet in 2013. It was comparing cabbage versus PCI in people with three-vessel disease or left main. Um, so 1,095 three-vessel disease patients, 705 left main patients. It used a first-generation paclitaxel stent, and the primary outcome at five years was a composite of mortality, CVA, MI, and repeat revascularization. So we just saw the primary outcome was superior for cabbage. Let's take a look at the secondary outcomes. So for MI, cabbage was superior. For repeat revascularization, cabbage was superior. For death and stroke, there was no difference. Uh, for these kind of questions, it's important that you know approximately the numbers and whether various uh, secondary outcomes were different or no different. Um, and pay particular attention to if it's non-inferior or superior likely you will be asked this. Um, and also take note of, uh, say for the syntax score in particular, how it's stratified into low, intermediate, or high risk, and the differences between those three groups. So these are some potential questions that you should be able to answer about the syntax score. So you should be able to define it, you should be able to break down the three different groups, and how this affected the outcomes, and you should figure out how the syntax trial affected the guidelines in terms of three-vessel coronary artery disease and left main. One of the biggest critiques about the syntax
was that it dealt primarily with a historical cohort population. They used first generation defense, they might not have had the most up to date medical therapy. So the answer to this was the Syntax 2, which was published in the European Heart Journal in 2017. It compared contemporary, at that time, PCI groups with the historical PCI groups in the Syntax 1 trial. They used the heart team decision-making, bioresorbable stents, IVIS, modern guideline-directed medical therapy, CTO techniques, and their primary outcome was the same MACE at one year. And they found that in the Syntax 2 trial, the PCI arm was superior compared to the historic Syntax 1 cohort. Based on these two trials, you should be able to list and differentiate four things between Syntax 1 and Syntax 2 PCI cohorts which may affect those outcomes, as well as you should be able to provide a couple critiques of the Syntax 2 trial and why the results may not be that applicable. For example, you can say that, yes, the PCI group in the contemporary arm is superior to the historic, but we don't actually know the cardiac surgery or cabbage results in that arm, so we can't really compare that to the contemporary syntax true PCI cohort. The Freedom Trial is one that's very important for you to know. It really defined the role of cabbage in patients with multivessel disease and diabetes. You should know the inclusion criteria of so diabetic patients, coronary artery disease, and two or more arteries suitable for PCI or cabbage, symptoms or objective evidence of ischemia. You should know the study population in terms of their baseline characteristics. Again, you should know the primary endpoint and secondary endpoint. You should know which secondary endpoints are superior for which arm and approximately the right numbers. Uh, in terms of the numbers, you're often going to think, how accurate do I need to be? Um, do I need to go into decimal points? Probably not. Again, there's no defined answer to this out there. Um, but often for my exam, I rounded up to the nearest 5 or 10, and I did just fine. There's almost certainly going to be questions about Noble and Excel trials, so it's important you understand these two, how they're different, and compare them. So Noble, you should know the inclusion criteria. You should know the difference in enrollment between the two trials, because that was a little bit abnormal in terms of large trials as well. Again, you should know the primary outcome. You should know the time frame of the primary outcome, what the individual components going together make that MACE outcome. You should know which one is superior and approximately the right number. Uh, also understand how in secondary outcomes, um, know which ones are superior and which ones there's no difference. So for the Excel trial, the three-year results were published in 2016, the five-year results were published in 2019. Again, knowing the inclusion criteria is very important, as well as the actual uh, characteristics of each cohort. So this was for left main, it was a randomized control trial where the syntax score was less than 32. But of note, just for a left main lesion, it can yield a syntax score anywhere from 12 to 25. So the average syntax in this trial was 20.6, meaning that there was little, if any, disease apart from left main disease in these patients. This was an industry-sponsored, designed, and selected um, site-selected trial as well, which are important factors when it comes to their conclusions. The primary endpoint, composite of death, stroke, and MI at three years, PCI was found to be non-inferior. There was a composite death, CVA, and MI at 30 days. PCI was found to be superior. You should understand why this is. And essentially, it's the inherent risks of um, perioperative issues with cabbage. You should also understand the composite death, CBI, MI, and revascularization at three years. And the PCI was found to be non-inferior in this arm. You should know the five-year primary outcomes, the numbers, how there was no difference. You should know the secondary outcomes, the things that were different, that death was worse in the PCI arm, ischemia-driven revascularization was worse in the PCI arm, and cerebrovascular events, which is not stroke, is worse in cabbage. Again, with this trial, you should know the critiques. Um, the big one that's come out there over the past few years is the definition of MI they used in this study. Uh, the fact that they downplayed the death signal numbers. 
and the time to event curves as well. So a little pop quiz. Uh, today you may not know the answers to these questions, but you better know them walking into the written exam. The differences between the secondary outcomes between each arms and these two trials. And you should be able to list four reasons why the Noble and Excel trials came to different conclusions. And if you just go back in this presentation a little bit, all of this is laid out in the slides. So there were many trials that looked into arterial revascularization in cabbage. You should know about these trials, you should know the basic numbers in these trials, and you should know how the guidelines have been modified by these trials. So the first two trials that we're going to talk about are Ruby and Coronary, and these are actually off-pump, on-pump comparisons, not actual arterial grafting comparisons, but I've always just put these together in my mind. So the first one, Ruby looked at the 30-day one-year results published in 2009, five-year results published in 2017, both in the New England Journal. Um, you should know the short-term primary outcomes and the long-term primary outcomes. You should understand the differences between these two arms, how the outcomes at 30 days were not different, but at one year there was a higher composite rate of uh, primary outcome, so bad things happening in the off-pump group. Off-pump patients had fewer grafts used than planned, and the patency rate was lower at one year in this trial. Comparing the primary outcomes at five years, death was significantly different in the composite of death. MI and revascularization was also significantly different. You should understand the basic patient cohort in the Ruby trial. These were elective, stable cabbage patients. Surgeons needed to have done more than 20 to be able to enroll. VA hospitals with trainees were allowed to enroll. And there was about 65% follow up with these patients radiographically. So the coronary trial was another pump on pump trial 30 day results were published in 2012 five year results published in 2016 both in the new england journal you should be able to understand the list potential benefits and risks of off pump so they found that off pump patients needed less blood pr product transfusion there was less perioperative bleeding less aki less respiratory complications and a shorter ventilation length and they also found that there were fewer graphs more incomplete revascularization and there was a signal for early repeat revascularization needs, although this wasn't statistically significant. Again, you should know the basics, you should know this is five year data, you should understand the clinical primary outcome and how it was no different between the two groups. You should also understand why the results were different in the coronary compared to the Ruby trials. So surgeons had to have higher experience, trainees were excluded, it was randomized by surgeon experience and had some higher risk patients. So a big trial that was published in New England Journal in 2019, the 10-year results of the ARCH trial, so a randomized control trial, BEMA versus single internal thoracic artery. Uh, you should know the primary outcome. It was not different in either group. Um, you should also understand this inclusion criteria where surgeons have to have done at least 50 BEMA operations. And you should understand a few of the big critiques and weaknesses. And two that are most commonly said was a high radial use, especially in the CETA arm, a high crossover of both arms, but particularly the BEMA to CETA direction. There are a few radial artery studies that I'm going to briefly touch upon. Uh, you should know the basics of them. So you should know the RAPS study. It's a Canadian study. Um, the primary outcome was functional graft occlusion of radial artery versus saphenous vein. And you should, based on this, understand the relationship between worse proximal stenosis and radial patency, in particular how this is demonstrated in the guidelines. Another big radial trial is the RAPCO trial, and this looked at radial artery versus the RETA graft in younger patients versus saphenous vein graft in older patients. We have six-year midterm data. They looked at survival, event-free survival, and graft patency uh, at midterm, and they were found to be similar between the arms. Um, also important to understand why the graft occlusion and patency was different from the RAPS trial. And that was essentially how they defined a failure of a graft angiographically. Of the radial trials, this is probably the most important one for you to know. It's called radial. It's a uh, six RCT combined analysis. It includes the RAPS and RAPS co-trials, 
as well as a few others. It was published in the New England Journal in 2018. They looked at a clinical primary composite outcome of death, MI, and repeat revascularization. They also looked at a graft patency for a secondary outcome. For, uh, some of the trials looked at that. Uh, you should also know the individual outcomes that make up the primary composite and how they differ between the groups. Next, we're going to briefly talk about some of the PCI and imaging trials. It's important because they define some of the uh, cutoffs and numbers that we use routinely in cardiac surgery. First thing to talk about is the Orbital trial, which was published in 2017 in Lancet, I believe. Um, it was PCI versus sham for angina relief in patients with stable angina. Their primary endpoint was a change in exercise time at six weeks. And the result of this trial was there was no difference between PCI and sham. They also found no difference in the Duke treadmill score or Seattle angina questionnaire. They did find PCI was better in improvement in stress echo and complete freedom from angina. You should know the definition of that. The FAME trial was important uh, for a couple reasons. So it was published in 2009 in the New England Journal. It compared FFR guided PCI versus angiography guided PCI. The primary outcome they found that the composite of death, MI, and revascularization was superior for FFR-guided PCI, and it, this was a trial that really solidified the FFR threshold of 0.8 in the literature. The FAME 2 trial, also published in the New England Journal a couple years later, was an RCT comparing FFR-guided PCI to optimal medical management. This was in patients with stable coronary disease. The primary outcome was at one year composite of death, MI, and urgent revascularization. It was found to be superior for the PCI arm, driven entirely by urgent revascularization. There was no difference in death or MI. You may be asked a question how to differentiate between non-invasive diagnostic tools for coronary artery disease, and the Pacific trial, which was published a few years ago in the New England Journal, does exactly this. So for this trial, the control is FFR, and they used hemodynamically significant FFR value of less than 0.8, and they were able to compare um, CT, SPEC, and PET, and CT was the most sensitive, SPEC is the most specific. PET had the overall highest diagnostic accuracy. Other important things to note in cardiac surgery are the two shock trials, as well as blood transfusion trials, and how these make it into guidelines and recommendations from societies. So the shock trial was published in the New England Journal in 2009. There were 300 patients with shock due to MI that were randomized to revascularization or medical stabilization. Primary outcome mortality at 30 days, there was no difference, but the mortality was superior at six months in the revascularization arm. The shock 2 IABP trial published in the New England Journal in 2012. There were 600 patients with shock due to MI randomized to get balloon pump or not. Primary outcome was mortality at 30 days. There was no difference. All secondary outcomes showed no difference either. So you should know how the SHOCK-2 trial changed the recommendations from the main guidelines on balloon pump usage in MI shock. You should also be able to explain the physiologic mechanism of how a balloon pump works and explain clinical scenarios where a balloon pump is useful and where there are contraindications to balloon pump placement. In terms of blood trials, the two big ones that you should know about are the TRIX-3 and the TITER-2. You should understand the basic idea behind the restrictive and liberal blood transfusion, the cutoffs they used, and how they defined these cutoffs at different points in the patient's kind of stay in the hospital, whether it's peri-procedurally or in the ICU or on the ward. Um, they have different endpoints and timelines. Um, you should understand the difference between the two and also the differences in the group within these guidelines or endpoints. There are a few trials that have investigated anticoagulation recommendations for all mechanical valves. You should know these trials and know how they affect the guidelines, particularly in relation to the onyx valve. So the PROAC trial was divided into two groups, the high risk and low risk. High risk used a lower dose versus a higher warfarin dose uh, in these high risk mechanical ADRs. You should know what makes someone a high risk, and so that includes people with atrial fibrillation, a decreased LV ejection fraction, 
a big left atrium, spontaneous contrast in left atrium, history of neural events within a year, hypercoagulability, ventricular aneurysm, more women on estrogen. The primary endpoint was freedom from bleeding, thromboembolism, and valve thrombosis at five years, and was found to be non inferior in the lower dose arm in comparison to the higher dose work or not. So the low risk PROACT trial were dual antiplatelet therapy versus standard warfarin and low risk mechanical agents. So low risk, meaning all the inclusion criteria from the previous slide were not present in these patients. And so these patients were randomized to warfarin with ASA81 versus Plavix with ASA81 after three months of having warfarin therapy already. And the primary outcome was freedom from bleeding, thromboembolism, valve thrombosis at five years, and the dual antiplatelet arm was found to be inferior because they had excess thromboembolism cerebral events. And the trial actually had to be terminated early. Another trial was Dabigatran versus Warfarin in mechanical valve. This is the realigned trial. Their inclusion criteria was mechanical ABR or MDR. You could start, had to start the drug within seven days of surgery uh, in population A or within three months of surgery in population B. It was terminated early due to both excess bleeds and also excess thromboembolism events in the Dabigatran arm. So some questions you should be able to answer based on these trials. So if you have a 56-year-old woman with a mechanical onyx aortic valve, ejection fraction 35%, a left atrium of 44 millimeters, can you use an alternative anticoagulation strategy to warfarin with an INR target 2 to 3? And what do the guidelines say regarding alternative anticoagulation strategies for both low-dose warfarin and alternative anticoagulation strategies? There are a number of important mitral valve trials that you should know, trials that compare two modalities head-to-head. -head. These are the two CTS net trials for moderate and severe MR. You should know the Everest and COAPT are mitral FR trials. For the CTS net trials, you should know the mortality in each arm, the rate of recurrent MR, the rate of hospitalizations, LV and systolic volume index, neurologic outcomes in each arm, and SVT in each arm. You should know which endpoints are significantly different and which are not. And you should also know how these affect the ACC AHA 2017 valve guidelines. The Everest and Everest 2 trials are interesting in that they really define the criteria for metroplasm. These are criteria that you should know, even though in day to day risk of life you probably don't have a lot of experience with the clip. You should know the anatomic indications and contraindications. Also with COAPT and MITRA FR, these are very large trials that came out a couple of years ago. They look, you should understand the primary endpoints for each of them. You should understand how the patient population differed in each uh, trial. And you should also have an idea, be able to list, say, five things, why the trials ended up with different results. MCS, VAD, ECMO, these trials, there are plenty of them in cardiac surgery. Uh, and you should know the basics of quite a few of them. So the rematch, heart rate 2, advance, endurance, momentum, and the two ECMO trials, Eula and Caesar as well. The rematch trial was the first trial published that really demonstrated the benefit of that. So it was a destination therapy heart rate, pulsatile flow VAD versus medical management, and they were able to show improved quality of blood at one year. Uh, however, there was a high burden of device for living morbidity of two years. The heart rate 2 destination therapy and bridge to therapy trials. Destination therapy compared heart rate 2 with heart rate 1. They found improved survival, stroke free survival, and reoperation at two years. And the bridge to therapy showed a survival to transplant at 80% 18 months. The advanced trial compared HVAD versus heart rate 2 probably less important than the endurance and momentum in terms of allocating appropriate brain space to these trials, but it did show that the HVAD was non-inferior to heart rate 2 at 180 days in survival and survival of transplant. You should really know endurance and momentum. You should know what they compared. You should know the eligibility criteria for patients in this trial. You should know the primary outcomes uh, and the secondary outcomes. So you should know that all stroke favors heart rate 2 in this trial, reoperation for failure favors HVAD, and the basic numbers detailing this. So the momentum trial is really big one you should know. It's heart rate 3 versus heart rate 2 in destination or bridge. The inclusion is advanced to refractory 
from heart failure, refractory medical therapy. You should know the primary outcome, which is survival, freedom from disabling stroke, re-op for a malfunctioning device at two years, and heart rate three was superior and was driven primarily by re-operation for device malfunction. The two ECMO ones you should know about and be able to understand and describe are the EOLA and CSER trial. These are trials on BV ECMO versus medical management and ARDS. They looked at mortality versus mortality and severe disability. They did come to different results and you should be able to understand why. So for example, the crossover and the transfer of cent two centers of excellence in the CSER trial, as well as various protocols. So pre ECMO ventilation strategies, which led to better results. And you are probably very familiar with this as we are in the middle of this COVID epidemic, but these trials kind of allowed us to build upon our knowledge of ventilation strategy and when to give ECMO and probably the, the basics of them are incorporated into your current COVID ECMO strategies at your individual centers. Some example questions that you should be able to understand and answer about the MCS trials. So for example, what was the rate of pump thrombosis in both devices in momentum and endurance? What are four design characteristics of heart rate three that improve pump thrombosis over heart rate two? How do patients in the EOLA trial have their ventilation strategies optimized in the control arm? The last big topic we're going to get into before we discuss briefly miscellaneous trials are the TAVI trials. These are very important and up and coming in the world of cardiology and cardiac surgery, so almost certainly there will be multiple questions about these on your exam. So the trials that really started things were the Partner 1A and 1B trials. Partner 1A compared to TAVR versus SAVR in high-risk patients. Partner 1B compared to TAVR versus medical management in inoperable patients. You should understand the inclusion criteria for each of these trials, and you should know the primary outcome, so primarily mortality, uh, both at short and long term. And in particular for the Partner 1A, you should know which complications favored surgical AVR over TAVI. The Partner 2 trial looked at TAVI versus SAVR in the intermediate risk patients. So you should understand the STS score between these different trials and how it crept down and how it's different the Corval versus the Edwards S3 Partner trial. Um, they looked at the primary endpoint of mortality or disabling stroke at two years, and overall it was the same. But it's important to know they did a subgroup, and if you just look at the transfemoral TAVI and you did not include alternative axis, it was superior to surgical AVR. You should also know which outcomes favor TAVI and which outcomes favor SABR in these groups. And the newest entry into the partner arena was published in the New England Journal in 2019. So this was for low risk patients, the one year outcome of death, CBA, or rehospitalization, and they found that the outcome was superior for TAVI. Um, it's important to know what favored TAVI and what favored surgical AVR and secondary outcome. You should also understand the critiques of this trial as well. So we're talking about the Medtronic trials. These are the core valve, um, the high risk and the retrospective extreme risk. So the extreme risk compared uh, TAVR in the core valve to the results in the part of 1B trial. They found their mortality and major stroke was similar at one year to the sapien results. The high risk core valve trial estimated 30 million mortality of between 15 and 50%. So a little bit different than the inclusion criteria for the Sapien partner trials. And the primary outcome at one year was superiority in mortality, 14 versus 19%. Uh, and the five-year results, which were published last year, found that these um, superior results did not hold out over long term. And at five years, uh, the two arms were essentially equal, although there was quite high death rate in both arms mainly due to the fact that these are quite elderly patients and they're getting high-risk procedures uh, and they're high-risk for many other comorbidities and factors. The SIRTAVI Intermediate Risk Trial was the Medtronic Intermediate equivalent to the Partner 2 that looked at TAVI versus SAVR in Intermediate STS between 3 and 15%. And you should understand how these numbers are different from the STS scores in the Partner Trial. Um, the primary outcome was mortality or disabling stroke at two years, which they found no difference. And again, you should know the differences between the arms. So TAVI favored less AKI, less atrial fibrillation, less transfusion. 
in surgery, there was less moderate or severe AI, less permanent pacemaker, less vascular complications. But there was no difference in MACE, mortality, stroke, or bleeding. So the core valve evolute low risk trial, again, the low risk Medtronic TAVI trial. The TAVI versus SAVR in low risk patients with an STS score of less than 3%. The primary outcome was a composite of death or sibling stroke at two years. TAVI was favored for stroke bleeding complications, AKI and AFib. Sever was favored for paravalvular leak and placemaker implantation. So some basic questions about TAVI based on these trials and guidelines. According to the 2019 CCS position statement on TAVI, which factors favor TAVI and which favor Sever? In the Partner 3 trial, what's the rate of stroke in each arm at one year? And in the Evolute low risk trial, what's the rate of pacemaker in each arm at one year? There are many other trials that I'm just not able to get to today due to the time limit and my own sanity, um, but these are a few others that fit nowhere in particular so far, so we'll just throw them in as miscellaneous trials here at the end. You should know about the STITCH trial and the STITCH's 10-year follow-up data. You should know the difference between the two arms, inclusion and exclusion criteria, understand the primary endpoint, and understand the mortality at 10 years and also understand how this has changed from previous updates in the trial, and have a rationale for why all cores mortality wasn't different prior to the 10 years, and also um, keep in mind the CV-related mortality and hospitalizations previous to this, particularly how they've been superior. One thing that is not a randomized control trial that we should talk about today would be a California database on mechanical versus biological prosthesis for AVR and MVR. It's a retrospective administration database. It's important for two reasons. One, it's quite a large data set. Um, they published 15 year mortality data with 25,000 patients. And based on this data set that was published, a lot of the guidelines modified their recommendations for what valves should be put in, in which position, in which patient uh, age point. So this really helps us understand how the guidelines have been developed and where the numbers are actually coming from. You should also understand the complications related to each type of valve uh, and the overall trend over the years towards more tissue valve usage. There has been lots of talk over the past five to 10 years about a revitalization of the Ross procedure. An RCT was published about the ROS in The Lancet in 2010. It compared the ROS with the versus homograft, and it did show there was a survival difference at 10 years. Uh, you should understand the survival difference and also how these numbers relate to the previous slide, the California Administration Database numbers for both mechanical and tissue valve. There aren't that many aortic trials you need to understand, but two that you should know are the ADSORB and the instead XL. Uh, so ADSORB looked at stenting and uncomplicated type B. You should understand the imaging endpoints, not the clinical endpoints were used, uh, and the numbers that drove the positive results in that trial. You should also know the T-bar versus optimal medical therapy and uncomplicated type B in the said XL trial. They used clinical endpoints of mortality, aorta-specific mortality, and progression. Um, and also keep in the back of your mind that the stent graft induced false lumen thrombosis and that was associated with better survival and lower progression of disease. There aren't that many trials in pediatric cardiac surgery, but one that you should know is the single ventricle reconstruction trial, comparing the Thano versus the Petit Shunt in hypoplastic left heart syndrome kids. So know the two groups, know the numbers with under, uh, transplant free survival rates at one year and six years, how it was significant initially, but then not so at six years. And you should also understand the drawbacks of the RVPA conduit, some of the side effects. One of the big trials in cardiac surgery in infective endocarditis is the EASE trial. It's early versus conventional treatment for infective endocarditis. Know the inclusion criteria. You should know this based on the Duke criteria already. Uh, understand the exclusion criteria. Know the primary outcome, which was in hospital mortality and clinical embolic events within six weeks. Uh, and you should understand how that primary outcome was driven. So that's it for trials I'm going to cover today. There are potentially a lot more trials that we can talk about, especially as we get more towards the peripheral of cardiac surgery and get more into cardiology or we go back in time even further. I would recommend that you stick with the ones that we did talk about and 
try to learn them as best as you can. Those are going to be the highest yield for your exam, where you're going to be able to get the most points. The last thing I want to talk about is the black box of COVID and how it may show up on your exam. So there won't be any trials talking about COVID that you will have to know for your exam for the written component. So I suspect you will have to understand management of these patients for your oral exam, particularly when it comes to when to put them on ECMO. So again, less relevant for the written, but more relevant for the practical oral.